Is our wayside. It's good to be with you again. Happy St. Patrick's Day to you. The day that the gospel was brought into Ireland by St. Patrick. So I got my green on and uh, back with you for another Wednesday devotion as we continue through Galatians. Um, wanted to give you just a, a quick update on myself as well. Um, I have not been doing well. Uh, it was about two and a half weeks ago. Just kind of a general flu feeling came on, had a fever, body aches, chills, uh, just exhausted and fatigued. Uh, we had a COVID test. It was negative. So I knew it wasn't that. Figured it was just the flu and I'd get over it. And it kind of kept lingering on going on close to two weeks. So went to urgent care, had to try to figure out what was going on. Um, the fever was lingering and the, the aches and the fatigue. And they did some blood tests there. Turns out I have mono. Seems incredibly random. No idea how I got it, but it explains why I've been feeling the way I've been feeling and uh, why I've been so tired. So right now I'm about two and a half weeks, a little over two and a half weeks into it. And they said it can take four to six weeks to really get through this. And some of that fatigue may linger on. So uh, that's the reason you haven't really seen me around at church, doctor's orders, get as much rest as possible, sleep, lots of fluids, um, until things can kind of get back to normal. And I, I hope they can soon. So that's what I'm doing uh, here with Wednesday Devotion from my home, as you can see. And we're going to get back to it and get into Galatians. And the goal is for me to get as much rest as possible. And uh, so hopefully that I can join all of you when it comes to Holy Week and be there, uh, especially Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter, uh, for sure, the, the biggest day of the year. So the timing of this isn't exactly the best. Um, Holy Week is like the week for pastors and churches. It doesn't get any busier than that, um, more stressful than that, more exhausting than that. So like I said, trying to get the rest that I can leading up to that. Um, tackle that week, celebrate that week with you, and then probably get some rest afterwards too. So uh, those of you that have been around the church uh, or, or heard that announcement from Pastor, Pastor Kyle last week, thank you for your prayers um, and your thoughts. And I just need a little bit of patience uh, to, to get through this. So I had the, the privilege of being with you last week as we looked at Galatians 3. That's where we're going to pick up. So Galatians 3, and we're going to just get through these verses here, 23 through 29, as you can see here. And so the Apostle Paul, uh, well, I'll read the whole thing through, and then we'll, we'll walk through verse, verse by verse. Uh, so he writes, Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then... The law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female for you are all one in Christ Jesus and if you are all Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. And that is the end of chapter three right there. So let's take a look at this, these first two verses. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law. Uh, what I want to say here is now, well, he says now before faith came. Well, it's, it's always been by faith. I think one of the the errors that can be made is thinking that, well, the Old Testament was about works, and then the New Testament is about grace, but it's always been by faith. There's that great chapter um, in Hebrews, Hebrews 11, uh, I believe, you know, the, the hall of faith, you know, by faith, Noah did this, by faith, Abraham did this, by faith, David, and it runs through uh, all those, yeah, Hebrews chapter 11, um, all those uh, acts of faith in the Old Testament. What this is saying in verse 23 is the object of that faith. So they knew that there was a promise of a Savior who was to come, but who was he? Uh, what was he going to be like? When was he going to arrive? Well, we know who that is. That's the person of Jesus. So 
You could, you could see Paul saying that here in verse 23, now before the object of faith came. So their faith in the Old Testament was looking forward to the one who was to come. You know who has come. Um, and you know who exactly who the object of your faith is, Jesus Christ, his work, his death, his resurrection. And so the law before that revelation had come had a, a specific role. And when we talk about law, when Paul uh, mentions law, uh, we are remembering that it's not just moral law, but it's law that was specific to the Israelites in the Old Testament. And so the law uh, in the Old Testament is broken up into three categories. One is ceremonial. Secondly is civil. And then there is moral. So the ceremonial laws were the laws that dictated uh, how they functioned as a religion, you know, within the temple, what were their uh, cleansing rites, how did sacrifices work uh, for this sin, what did this sacrifice require, what the day of atonement looked like, what the Passover looked like, um, how these things were built into the life of Israel and into the, the, the religion of Israel, very specific to them for that time. And they were all pointed forward to, all these things pointed forward to the object of that faith that would be revealed, Jesus. So the lambs being slaughtered on the altar. Who's Jesus called in John chapter three? The lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, right? Passover, which reminded the, the Israelites of the great uh, and compassionate hand of God, freeing his people from the Israelites and bringing them to freedom um, through the sacrifice of a lamb and the blood painted on the doorpost. And Jesus, what does he do on the Passover night? He dies on the cross, his blood spilled so that the wrath of God would pass over us and that we would be free, not from physical slavery, but from sin, death, and the devil. So this law in the Old Testament actually functioned to, as a type or a shadow uh, or a you know, foreshadowing of what is to come. This is so cool, I think, about how God designed and arranged uh, and, and built all of this, and it all points to Christ. So that was the ceremonial law. Secondly was civil law. And it was the civil law similar to like what we have. We have laws in this nation that are not applicable in other nations. There were civil laws God had given to his people for the nation of Israel. Um, how you interact, how you marry, how you uh, trade, handle business. Uh, what does justice look like if you accidentally injure somebody, if uh, you cause damage to someone else's property? Uh, it's just very practical things, which again, we would say aren't directly applicable to us, uh, but again, had a shadow of God's grace, mercy, and compassion. The third then, so we had uh, ceremonial, civil, and then moral, moral law, and that is still applicable today. So because Christ has come, those first two, ceremonial, ceremonial and civil, are no longer applicable to us. Those have been fulfilled in Christ. We don't need the, the sacrificial system. We are not the nation of Israel. We don't need uh, those specific laws, but God's moral laws are the ones that are written on our heart. Right? Do not murder, do not steal, do not commit adultery, do not covet, you shall have no other gods. These things are timeless and for all people. And so what, what kept these people imprisoned that he's saying in verse 23, until the coming faith would be revealed, were those ceremonial and those civil laws, um, in a sense, as we're going to see in verse 24, keeping watch over them uh, because the, the fullness of faith hadn't been revealed. Verse 24, so then uh, the law was our guardian. There you go. He says, um, until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. So the law functioned as a a foster parent, if you want to think of it like that, right? It wasn't our legal guardian, right? It wasn't, uh, we hadn't been adopted into that family yet, but it was like a, a temporary parent uh, until we would be adopted into, brought into God's family. And Paul uses this phrase in verse 24, now that Christ has come, we might be justified by faith. One of the cries of the Reformation um, one of the, not one of the, it is the foundation of our doctrine, 
uh, justification by faith, the doctrine that it is said uh, upon which all other doctrines stand on, um, the, the freeness, the, the, the free gift of salvation through Christ. Uh, justification means to is a legal term used by Paul in the New Testament, meaning to be declared innocent, declared righteous. Um, it, it's a very legal term. And you are declared innocent and righteous. How? Simply by faith. By believing that you are. By believing the promise of God when he says you are. God says you are. Do you believe it? Yes. Then you are. Let it be for you as you believe, as it says in one of our rites of, of absolution. Um, and so he reinforces that in verse 25. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So what we don't want to get mixed up here is to say that, well, we're, we're not under the law. I can do whatever I want, right? Uh, I'm, in, I'm in God's family. I'm no longer under this guardian of the law. Well, no. Uh, Paul specifically address, addresses this in Romans chapter 6. Uh, shall we go on sinning that grace may abound? The answer, by no means, right? You, uh, how can you still live in sin when you have died to it because you've been baptized to Christ, he says in there. Um, but what you are no longer under the guardianship of is the, the ceremonial or those civil laws, nor do you put your hope in the law in order to become a part of that family of God. Right? Those, those laws still uh, the, the moral laws still certainly apply because that's how, what, how God has designed and ordered his creation for us to live by. So we don't get rid of those, but we uh, eagerly and joyfully walk in obedience to that because we've been adopted into God's family. So we see those laws as good, but they don't serve as that guardian anymore, kind of preparing us for um, Christ as it served in the Old Testament. And this is why it's no longer a guardian in verse 26. He says, for in Christ, you are all what? Your sons, your daughters, your children of God. It's not the law that did that. It's still here, but um, you've been adopted into that. You are all sons of God. How? Right here through faith. Uh, what ties faith and the family of God and this adoption process together? Verse 27. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And so this is now uh, how you have been brought into the family of God, not through obedience to the law, but through baptism. And what a wonderful way you, many of you have been brought in through infant baptism even. Because what did you have to do with it? Nothing. You, you, you put forth no effort in that. You can't claim any uh, boasting towards that effort. You were brought on behalf of the faith of, faith of your parents and God created faith in you on that day, uh, just like he did me. And I have nothing to boast because of that. Uh, a child is helpless, but God uh, claimed me and he, he claimed you. So you have put on Christ. Uh, that is the, the garment that you wear. It is who you are. And that is where your your foundation as an identity lies and what he's going to say here in verse uh 28 is that there's no barrier that keeps anybody from coming to christ so after he says you've been baptized into christ he reminds us where our identity lies there is neither jew nor greek there's neither slave nor free there is no male or female for you are all one in christ jesus so two things are going on in this verse. One, you say this is where your identity lies. Your identity throughout this life will change. And when it does, we get rattled, right? I can say right now, my identity is as a husband, a father, a pastor. Those are pretty, pretty three big ones there. Those can change. Uh, those can change. Uh, quickly and for reasons beyond my control and, and sometimes tragically so and people have been through those and if we stake our sole identity on those things and then all of a sudden are shocked uh, when the rug is ripped out from under us uh, it leaves us uh, just floundering and without a foundation and, and wondering where to turn and saying who am I what's the point how can I go forward but when we know underlying everything that before I am a husband, a father, or a pastor. I am a 
I'm a son of God. And no matter what happens externally in this life, that doesn't affect, change, take away, alter, or diminish who Christ has called me to be in my baptism, that I'm his child. And see, the same is for you. You've been through changes in your own life uh, that are specific to you. But what has not changed is that identity there. So that's the first thing that's going on. Secondly, he's, he's reminding us that there's no barrier when it comes to that. There is not a, a privileged class when it comes to Christianity. Uh, you cannot boast and say, because I'm a man. Well, that's why I am a Christian or because I'm a woman, uh, because I am of this race, uh, because I uh, become because I come from a, a wealthy background or because I come from a impoverished background. Nobody can lay stake in those boasts of Christianity because those aren't what brought us to. It's only by the grace of God. And so that's why he's saying in, in Christ, it's not these things that matter. That's not how you came into this family. It's only because God brought you in through baptism. Now, word of caution, what happens in, in our day, verse 28, this thing gets spun in, and you hear a verse where he says there is no male or female. And people say, see, see that's the Bible talking about the, the trends that are going on right now uh, with uh, genders being messed with and, um, and these sorts of issues. That's not what it's saying. He's talking about where your ultimate identity lies in Christ and that there is no barrier when it comes to Christ in terms of, of class or uh, anything else. It has to do with salvation and God working in that, uh, not with what we can readily, readily observe with the senses that God has given to us that now there, there are, and indeed male and female, right? There are still Jews and Greeks. Right? There are still different nationalities. There are still slave and there are still free throughout the world, right? There are rich and there are poor. What he's saying is, that's not your identity in Christ. And you have so much more in Christ, even if you have nothing in this world. And then he ends it in verse 29. And if you are Christ's, just following this logic here, if you are Christ's, ties it back to where we began last week in bringing it to Abraham. Because remember, Paul is talking to those Judaizers who know the Old Testament scriptures very well and who are trying to impart those Jewish traditions onto new Christians of this time. And so Paul brings all this back to say that if, if you are in Christ's, if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring. You are an heir, according to that promise. That promise given all the way to Abraham uh, back in Genesis when he says, you will be a blessing to the nations. And you are one of those grains of, stand, grains of sand or stars in the sky when God said to Abraham that his offspring shall be like those. You have been grafted into that. So the history of the Old Testament is your history uh, because you have been brought into the family of God. Well, I love the opportunity to be with you again uh, another week. We will continue these going. Um, hopefully, I can continue to get some rest, get some fluids, uh, be with you again soon. Um, feels like forever since I've been able to actually uh, do some preaching, and I look forward to it soon. And I hope I can be uh, back on my feet, back to it, and feeling good again. Thank you again for the prayers. Happy St. Patrick's Day, and we'll see you again soon.